My name is Stanley Sword. I have the great pleasure to welcome fighting pilot Mandy Hickson from the Royal Air Force. And uh, you were the second woman to fly a Tornado GR4. You did three tours of duty and 45 missions over in the, in the Kuwait war. Uh, and and uh, your life has been a bit like a tornado uh, and you've flown a tornado. Tell us what's what's do you have a relationship with your plane is it like when you have when you're a, you know a race driver and you have your own car so to say your formula one car oh i'd like to say so actually well, i was really lucky i did have my name written on the side of my airplane which was a lovely one so i did get a lot of photos taken on that day um when i had finally got my name on a jet which was brilliant but you don't get to fly the same airplane all the time so you would know which ones were more reliable than others, though. And when you saw that you had a certain one, you're like, oh, not that one. That always breaks. <laughs> yeah. So it was And quite uh, when they were taking out of duty, do you know what happened to it? Uh, have you have you lost track of your, your tornado? I don't know, actually. I think my one had probably been repainted because when I was flying it, it was quite a few years ago now. So I think my one had probably already been repainted. In fact, do you know what? I don't even know what my tail fin number was. I should probably look it up and find it, find out what's happened to it. <laughs> what's your first memory of, of uh, flying? Um, well, when I was 14, I flew uh, as a young air cadet. And I just remember I came down and I, and I remember quite distinctly saying to my parents, it's like dancing in the sky. You know, um, it's it just feels like poetry in motion, really. It's it's a a really beautiful, uh, there's nothing I love more than a, a dreary grey day on the ground and you take off and then you pop above the clouds and it is just brilliant blue. And yet, if you were on the ground, it would be a horrible day and it's not, it's a lovely day above. Um, and so, yeah, the nice thing with flying is that you can normally fly the, find the blue sky somewhere. And uh, do you ever dream about flying at night? Yeah, I, I flew at night a fair amount, actually. So, um, yeah, you do a lot of night flying. And one of the things with the tornado is it has the ability to fly at low level on autopilot at night, which is quite nerve wracking. Um, basically, your hands off. Well, you're not you're following the controls, but you're looking at the ground on a forward looking infrared. And, you know, you're literally contouring the ground as you're going. But the computer is flying the aircraft. And that is quite incredible. Mm. And uh... Your grandfather was a fighting pilot during the Second World War. Uh, yes. Tell us about your journey into becoming a pilot. Well, I grew up hearing stories from him, um, you know, daring and do and all of this side of things. And I think just that by osmosis, you start to just hear the excitement and you start to maybe think, oh, wow, this sounds like quite an exciting job to do. And so when the Air Cadets opened its doors to girls when I was 14, I joined that club. I flew and it fostered a love of the military and of a career potentially in aviation. Um, I then went off to university, I gained my private pilot's license and they changed the they changed the rules for women to be able to fly whilst I was at university, so in 1990. And so in my second year of university, I applied to join the Air Force. Um, I took all the tests. I sadly failed quite a lot of the aptitude tests initially. Um, and then I took them again and I failed them again. But at the time, women were only just allowed to start to fly and they couldn't understand why actually predominantly a lot of women were failing the tests and they realised that maybe they were designed for men and maybe there was some unconscious bias in there because men, men and women do process things slightly differently. And so they looked at re-engineering the tests and we see more equal footing. In the end, I was taken on as a test case to see actually how far I would go, even though I had not got much aptitude as far as these tests were concerned. So I was very lucky that people believed in me. Um, and then throughout my flying training, you know, I had a wonderful team around me, a support network of fantastic gentlemen and um, not very many women at all, but uh, the, the occasional woman, which was fantastic. And yeah, I, you know, and I finally got to fly the tornado on the front line. Mm. And uh, where did you do your education? And uh, um, what different, the different parts that it, that it couldn't say enough? Um, so I was educated, uh, I, I grew up in a place called Manchester. Um, most people know Manchester United or Manchester City because they know the football teams. Um, and then I went off to university in uh, Birmingham and I studied a degree that was not relevant to flying at all, actually. I did a geography and a sports science degree. 
um, because I enjoyed those subjects. And you don't have to cert study certain subjects to be a pilot in the Air Force. Uh, in fact, you don't even need a degree. Um, you can stop and go in straight at the age of 18 if you wanted to. Um, and then I joined the Air Force straight after university at 21. And where was that? Where is it located? Um, well, you're, you grow, you move all over the country, basically. I think I served in seven different Air Force bases uh, in different locations. But initially, you start at a place called RAF College Cramwell, which is in Lincolnshire, so right on towards the east side of the country. Mm. And uh, in Britain, is there a special you know, connection with flying? You have the Wright brothers and you have the uh, you know, connection with America, the first flies across the Atlantic. Uh, yeah. How, how um, does that interact with, with present day? You know, I, I still think we work very closely with the Americans as well, actually. In fact, we, we work with all of NATO forces as well on different exercises. And um, I always think, you know, there always is a sort of feeling of pioneering spirit and certainly coming up with new designs for aircraft types and things like that. So we've still got a very good, you know, manufacturing base for aircraft with British Aerospace and um you know, different companies like Raytheon who do the missile system. So actually, we still very much are on the developmental side of, of a aviation industry still. Mm. And uh, there's there's the Rolls-Royce engines, not in the tornado. But uh, when you think of history in Britain, you think of, you know, your, your fleet, the boats. But how about the history of your planes? Yeah, well, actually, they are Rolls-Royce engines, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we do have in the Tornado. So, you know, it's been lovely often, well, since I've left and I end up doing talks and often I'll end up speaking to the likes of Rolls-Royce and they'll say, oh, what do you think of our engines? I'm like, yeah, they're pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. They kept me safe a lot of the time. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. That, that manufacturing base goes all the way down. It's not just about the aircraft frame, but you're bringing in so many different constitutional parts of industry to create the final product. And uh, uh, you, you, how many different countries have you flown in? Oh, um, around about ten, probably. I don't, can't, I don't want to sit here and count them up, but yeah, probably about ten different countries. You were in Canada, for example. Tell us about other different parts of the world where you yeah uh, trained. And... Yeah, one of my favorite places to be was um, is training out in uh, in North America, basically in the Arizona desert. So we've uh, go to a place called Nellis Air Force Base, which is just outside Las Vegas. And it's really great because the training out there was replicating the temperature and the desert that we'd be flying on um, over in the Gulf when the Iraq conflict was going on. And so actually we were training as a coalition. So we would have forces from all over the world that would come together. So I think we had, say, the Swedish Air Force would come, Turkish, uh, French, Canadians. And you're up against, uh, you know, the uh, pilots from America as well. So we'd all be working together on these huge big coalition missions. Um, and you'd be doing air to air combat as well. So you'd have fighters up there. The Americans were the, the red air, the baddies. That really was top gunny. Um, and their job was to try to shoot you down, which they were pretty good at. Uh, we were often dropping live weapons over there as well. So it was an exciting exercise to be part of. Yeah, it was probably one of my favorite sort of exercises to do. And which different weapons does the tornado have and, and uh, how many of them have you used? Um, so it's got lots of different weapons. Well, it's, it doesn't, doesn't now because it's now out of service, sadly. But um, at the time, basically, we had different sorts of thousand pound bombs. So they're called enhanced paveway bombs. So um, different sizes of them, 1,000 or 500 pounds, 1,000 pound bombs, 2,000 pound bombs. Uh, you have GPS guided weapons, um, you know, so there's lots of different sort of technicalities as well. They got rid of things like cluster bombs because they were dangerous, ones that were used to explode on the runway because they would form almost like a, a landmine, which could be potentially dangerous. So, that they, you know, those were banned. There's a huge weapon called Storm Shadow, which is a phenomenal weapon that can be dropped and it literally can go hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, and, you know, there's another one called Brimstone, whereby you would drop the weapon and it would release little bomblets and they would recognize friendly or enemy different pieces of equipment. So it could be an enemy tank versus a, a you know a friendly tank and the brimstone weapon recognizes that into its software. So some very clever pieces of technology out there now. Mm. And how does the day look like when you're in the uh, Arizona desert or you're in, in, in the base in England training? Uh, 
what does it contain of you wake up at home or you live on the base always or it depends go... really i mean if you're on detachments you're obviously living on the base or living in a local hotel um but basically when we're based in the uk people are allowed to live in their own homes or some live on base in quarters or in the office's mess but it, every day it always starts with a met brief a meteorological brief so the weather and that's often at eight o'clock in the morning or if you're on the early wave it might be 6 30 so you will always have the met brief and you know whatever state you are in however tired you are everyone turns up for the met brief whether you're flying or not and you basically have the the brief which sets the you know the program for the day who's doing what you might be on it to fly you might be doing secondary duties and taskings um and then a cycle of um for the day would be set and basically you know even a two-hour mission you would have a two-hour planning cycle for it 45 minute out brief and walk to the jet you know and getting all your kit on a two-hour mission by the time you've come in got a cup of tea and then your hours debrief you could probably be looking about six hours for one flight so it's quite a lengthy process and, and then you fit in all your secondary duties around your flying and how many hours do you fly a year it depends. Uh, it depends how lucky you are. They they kept on cutting the hours back, actually, as cuts were hitting the military. And um, it used to be that you tried to fly around about 18 to 20 hours a month. But that got cut more and more. And I think at some point it got down to about 12 hours a month, which is really not enough flying. If you think uh, that's on average three hours a week, that's not enough to keep current. And so, yeah, I think that we, we that becomes a bit more of an issue on um, currency levels. Hmm. And how is it to fly? Uh, you know, in, in real life compared to in a simulator? Um, well, the simulators are brilliant, actually. So they're fully motion. They've got full screens. You sit in there, you strap into your aircraft, even down to fitting on your G-suit and all the equipment. So when you're flying it, it's a it's a brilliant way of practicing what you would do and, and at a much, much cheaper cost. So all things like instrument flying, which is you know how you would land purely by looking at your instruments if the weather was poor actually why not practice that in the simulator because you know rather than trying to replicate it all the time in the air you can do a lot of that flying on the ground and at mm. a much cheaper cost mm. and uh, in in the, the kuwait war seven tornadoes was shot down and and uh, half of them died and half of them were taken as prisoners of war uh how how was that reality for you? Yeah, so, well, I, to be honest, I was so that was 30 years ago. Um, so Gulf War One was 30 years ago now. And um, in that fact, 30 years at this moment in time, I think the ceasefire was on the 28th of February, 30 years ago. So there's been a lot going on on social media at the moment, sharing um, people's memories. Uh, there's one of the prisoners of war is a guy called John Nichols, and he basically has written a fantastic, well, lots of books on it. Um, but he's been sharing almost like the daily journey of what was happening throughout the Gulf War One, And, you know, it's incredible, really, to see, you know, what was going on. But I mean, I was at school at the time, so I knew it was happening, but um, it, it didn't really resonate with me as much because I was, you know, playing netball and doing sport and doing what a young girl does at, sp at school. So it's only really now reflecting back and knowing, you know, colleagues that have lost their lives that you think, my goodness, it must have been incredible and very scary to be part of that. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, you became the squadron's combat survival and rescue officer as well, and instructed on escape and aviation tactics. Uh, tell us about, that sounds super exciting yeah, it, i don't know if it's super exciting but yeah you do quite a lot of training so we go to a huge big moor called dartmoor and um there's a lot of running around evading troops and soldiers that are trying to catch you as if you are simulating it that you've ejected over enemy territory so we learn all the skills for survival um everything from building shelters and to building fires that can be you know hidden almost so like a fire under the ground almost um you know, to how to find water, how to find food, um, you know, all of these skills, and we put them all together. And then also what happens if you ejected over water? So once you've be become an instructor in this, you can go back to your squadron and then you basically are in charge of everyone's currencies and things like that because you have to do things like water drills of jumping, 
you know, off the back of a boat that's being pulled along to check, could you get out your parachute and get into your dinghy if you're at sea? So we have to do those every, you know, couple of years and in a pool every year. So, you know, your role basically is to instruct people once you have the knowledge in how to do that and to maintain currencies. And it becomes more and more relevant when you get out to a war zone, because, of course, then you are also looking at the escape and evasion plan. If you were to eject in over Iraq, how how would you basically escape? How would you evade and how would you hopefully set up a plan to get you out of there? Mm. And is there a difference, you think, in the education of pilots between different countries in the US, Britain, Russia? And so um, on? Yes and no. I think, you know, you, you're, you're obviously going to be recruiting similar minded people. And you know that because whenever you get together in a room full of pilots, they'll generally all get on pretty well, actually. Um, you do see slight differences. Um, I always think the French seem very relaxed, um, but it's more that they're replicated in their cultural differences um, in intrinsically who we are as different nations. Uh, I always love working with the Americans, but they are very, very process driven. They're a little bit more earnest, perhaps. Uh, you've got the Brits that is very, are very sarcastic, you know, and that just comes across because you're still British or you're still Swedish or French. Just because you're a pilot, you're not going to be changing your culture. But you, therefore, that does translate ever so slightly in the way that you see them planning their missions and the, you know, hey, it's fine, the Italians, it's not a problem. Um, mm -hmm. So, you no, know, it's it's just different cultures coming together. And how many fighting pilots are there in the in the in Britain, active? Um, I don't know at the moment, Daniel. To be honest, um, that's not a fact I have to my fingertips. I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> And in your time, was it like a hundred or a thousand or? Oh gosh, no, not a, certainly not a thousand. I mean, tornado wise, you're talking hundreds um, of, of pilots, not certainly not thousands, and, and certainly within the fast jet community. I mean, the tornado when I was flying, it had seven squadrons, and you would probably have twenty to thirty, so probably about two hundred tornado pilots around that time um, would be on the front line. Um, and then you would have a Harrier squadrons and also Jaguar squadrons. So I don't know, really see about 500 maybe. Um, but obviously his capabilities change. That's gone down and down and down. And do you form bonds between you that will last for, for life or, or is yeah. it an individualistic occupation? No, 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 absolutely not. No, it's, it's incredibly um, high on the camaraderie and the teamwork. And um, especially the, the people I knew during training, I think the bond that you create with them is second to none. You know, I'm godmother to quite a few of their children. I'm still very much in touch with all, with all of them as well. Mm. And uh, when you were flying, what's the most traumatic experiences you have had uh, in um, a tornado? I got shot up by a surface-to-air missile uh, in Iraq that locked onto my engines, and we managed to evade it by putting out our countermeasures in the form of flares. That was pretty traumatic. But, um, again, there was a lot to be learned from that night. Um, I've had a big bird strike uh, where we hit a huge goose, uh, which was ingested into my engine, and it took out all of my equipment on, uh, on one side of the aircraft, and we had to do an emergency mayday, mayday landing. Um, at a Scottish airfield, which I basically had to dive into this airfield and there was a, a huge big 747 um, jumbo jet coming in and it had to go around for me and, as I <laughs> leapt into land. So that felt quite powerful. Um, but I was pleased, pleased to see the runway. Um, yeah, so that was, those are pretty memorable occasions. Mm. And uh, and uh, you, you, your husband, Craig, he's a pilot, Navy pilot originally and then a commercial pilot. How did yeah. you meet and, and uh, how is it to share a life with a, with a fellow pilot? Yeah, I think it's lovely. We met right at the early stages of my career. Craig was one of the instructors going through one of the courses when I was what's called holding, where you're waiting to do a course. And so we got to know each other then. Uh, and then we, we got together after I'd finished the course. And yeah, we, we always just got on brilliantly. Um, so I literally met him almost on day one of my Air Force career. And, you know, it's been lovely to share my journey and his journey through aviation together and, you know, be able to share our stories because we know what each other's talking about. So, you know, it's lovely to be able to do that as well. And we don't, well, we don't bore each other too much about flying stories particularly, but, you know, at least when he says, oh, I was doing this in the simulator, I can go, oh, really? Oh, that sounds fantastic. You know, so. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and yeah, uh, you have two kids now. Did you take them up in the air with you when they were young? Uh, young? Well, actually, I have um, four in total. So I have two stepchildren who are wonderful, but they're a bit older now. So Elliot and Francesca. Um, so I took up Elliot flying, actually, which was fantastic. And so of my four children, he's the only one I've actually taken flying, um, which was great. Uh, he's now 28. My 25-year-old daughter has um, just joined the police force, um, which is fantastic. So she's going through her training. And my two sons at this moment in time don't sh are not showing much interest in going towards aviation, which is a shame. But, you know, you never know. Uh, we can hold our fingers, keep our fingers crossed that they might change their minds at some point. And when people think about flying, they think about danger. But I guess it's more dangerous to, to uh, drive a car. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How many you know, turns around the globe have you flown, you think? Uh, and and uh, how do you experience the danger of it compared to being on, on ground? Do you yeah, feel I mean, safer up there? Yeah, yeah, you're very procedurally driven. So, of course, there's always going to be an element of risk, but there is an element of risk in everything that we do when we, when we get out of bed in the morning. Perhaps not so much at the moment because we're not allowed out because we're in lockdown. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's a it's an odd it's an odd one really. I've never felt particularly scared to be airborne. Um, you know, you're trusting in the systems, you're trusting in the aircraft, and and in the team around you. Um, it's not. I wouldn't say it's a da dangerous career. It's obviously going to be more risky than some other careers. For example, working in an office. You know, of course it is. Um, but it, with that comes excitement, challenge. You know, and this wonderful experience. So you know, there we are. Mm. And uh, do you build your body along the way? Do you, when you, uh, you know, when you finish the Air Force, do you have a, a strong body that will last for a hundred years, or are you worn out? I hope so. Well, actually, I haven't said that. I did have to have back surgery, but um, now I'm obviously the, um, you know, I'm invincible. I'm like Wonder Woman now. Um, but no, I'm, you know, I think you just keep yourself fit. Uh, I certainly don't think it wears your body out. No, I just think generally you're of a mindset whereby you want to keep a healthy body and healthy mind. Mm. And uh, your your husband was a navy pilot. How is it to land on on ships compared to land, you know, on, on regular airfields and yeah. different parts of landing throughout the so world? So he's he's only ever landed helicopters on ships, actually, which mm. is still pretty challenging. Yeah. yeah, I've always preferred, quite frankly, a um a, a concrete runway <laughs> that's mm. not moving <laughs> myself. And can you can you land? You know, if you if you have to re rescue land, so to say, can you land on on sand or or, or in a field or no, a tundra? Not or... No, no, not in a fast jet. You have to land on a runway. Um, it's too heavy. Um, in a small aeroplane, like a propeller aeroplane, if you have an emergency in a propeller aeroplane, you know, like a training aircraft, um, people, the sort of aircraft that people fly for their private pilot's licenses then they can land in fields or on sand, you know, because they're a much lighter aircraft. But no, the Tornado is a pretty heavy beast. Mm. And uh, you became a keynote speaker. You took all your knowledge and, and were able to, to pass it along. Now you help companies and, and uh, schools and such. Tell us yeah. about what lessons you give to others now from the life you learned, yeah. lived. So what's really nice is that the way we are as human beings is that our brains, we learn and we remember through storytelling. So if you give someone a whole load of facts and figures, they don't remember them. But if we hear a story, that's how we, we pass on information from generation to generation. And so my whole philosophy is that I share the stories of my time in the Air Force, of my journey to get to it, of resilience and determination to overcome challenges in process and protocols, but also utilizing the team around you. Um, there's so many wonderful stories on leadership um, and stress management and decision making under pressure. And they're all so relevant to business. But so long as you share it in the context of a story, people can remember that. And therefore, when they're thinking about doing something, they relate to it um, later on. And so I often get people telling me and regaling stories that they've heard me tell when I started my career eight years ago, they said, oh, the story that you told about cycling, you know, with your team. And I said, my goodness, it's amazing how well people remember them. Mm. So it's lovely and, to be able to share that. And which is the best story you have shared? I share a story, actually, which always gets quoted to me, which is about a young girl 
when I left the Air Force, I signed up as a volunteer and I would fly cadets. So it's how I started. And it's basically lovely to be able to, to pass on that love of flying to the next generation. And she was a 14 year old girl that seemed quite surly and a little bit classic teenage, you know, grunting. And I flew with her and she turned out to be one of the most natural pilots I've ever met. And, you know, I said to her, I think you're really talented. And she just said, oh, but you say it to everyone. And then I said, no, 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 you really are good. And suddenly her whole body language changed. And she suddenly said to me, actually, this is all I've ever wanted to do in my whole life. And I was so scared I was going to fail that I decided to basically not show you that I was interested and not try. Because in my own brain, I decided that if I didn't try, I could always blame it on that. And I think it was just such a good life lesson for all of us that, you know, we, we are open to that and we all fear this failure in some way where we back away from things whereas if we don't grab opportunities with both hands and try things we never know what we're going to be really great at you know and I sort of it also linked into when I was a young girl because once I had flown I then had a sense of purpose and a sense of drive that I'd been lacking perhaps up to that point and I think for herself suddenly she clicked as to why she was going through school because now she needed to gain a certain qualification to become a pilot and so start things start to come into place when we have purpose it then enables us to have resilience when things don't go well because we want to achieve a goal and so it brings together all of the aspects of self-belief about passing on a belief or a love of something to the next generation and actually encouraging people to be the very best versions of themselves mm. And which were your biggest flaws as a pilot? Did you have anything left you know, to, to improve? You always have everything to improve. Yeah, you're never a finished product. Um, but yeah, I just think, you know, there's nothing specific particularly, but, you know, you can always try to be better. And how can you compare different pilots side by side? Do, do, do you do like Top Gun uh, challenges yeah. and... and uh... yeah. We would do bombing competitions where it would be like working as a team, precision bombing on the range. So you would drop weapons and you would get scores about how far they are from the target. So we would do that sort of thing. But also, generally, there are people that you could consider to be a much better pilot than others. And of course, you're flying with a navigator or weapon systems operator in the back seat. And it's just an interesting one because they would also go, oh, no, they're a really good pilot. Well, not quite so good. And a lot, lot of it's often around that decision making situational awareness or also we call it just a good set of hands which means they're just a really good operator of the jet so you know there's lots of different things that determine whether someone's a better pilot than others and how much is the machine and how much is the pilot um probably 50 50 really i mean if you think about it though everyone's got the same machine so actually the only thing that would determine who would be a better pilot would be the actual skill set of the pilot involved and their and their um, capabilities, basically. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that the, the aircraft today are helping pilots with, with their awareness um, because of technology. But still, you still need to have a very high level of skill to be able to fly. And uh, when you do, you know, when you when you fly in games and such, uh, AI and and the Xbox and there's a lot of things that you know the, the, the driven technology does fighting pilots bring something to society what's developed there can then you know be used in society or or is it the other way around that they implement stuff from uh, from uh, a little bit of both really you know basically you know helping anyone's hand to eye coordination is always going to help you know creating good decision making is going to help so i think there's going to be a bit of um of both ways and do you do you have psychologists and and, and such and and train the mind uh to be strong as well do you do, you, uh, do you like visualization and uh no they don't tend to do too much of that actually which is a shame well they certainly didn't in my day i don't know if they do now mm -hmm. and uh uh, looking to the f you know to the future how do you think uh, fighting pilots and education and, and the planes will develop in in the coming decades from now uh, i think you're going to see more of a combination basically of um unmanned vehicles and manned vehicles and what you might see is that perhaps uh, formations going off with one pilot in a, in a piloted aircraft but there being a formation of eight aircraft that are all being flown by as drones um so things like that you're going to start to see more and more um 
you know, uh, looking at utilising those drones and unmanned aerial vehicles definitely in the um, in the workplace. And if you were to become a philosopher and write, you know, a, a chapter about the very essence of being a fighting pilot, what would that be? Um, I think it would be about being at one with your aircraft. I think it would be about um, the enabling of of seeing yourself as part of a, of a bigger picture, um, be it as a team or be it as part of a formation of aircraft. Um, and... Yeah, I just think it's about the coming together of, of a huge amount of skill sets to create, you know, overall just the, the best experience that you can possibly have. Mm. And until I'm not. <laughs> mm. And different seasons. Is it is it the, does it change much to fly in winter time compared to summer heat yeah. compared to minus degrees? Yeah, 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 De very much so. Because of course, the as the air changes temperature, it changes its density. So in the summer in hot high temperatures you know it takes longer to get airborne for example in cold temperatures you've got to wear an immersion suit to fly and so it's you know, it takes a lot longer to get into your kit um yeah it, it's a very different experience flying in all the different seasons and have you been able to to take lessons from you know your life as a fighting pilot to your everyday life now in decision making and and stress management and and such yeah, absolutely. One of my favourite mantras is control the controllables and if you can't, let it go. So, you know, it's a case of managing what you can and, and don't stress over the things that you can't. So there's loads of different things that I use in my everyday life still. And uh, your parents, uh, what's the greatest lessons you learned from them? Um, my mum always basically said to me, if it's going to be someone, why shouldn't it be you? And I think that's a lovely way to look at it is that I'd done as much as I possibly could. And it was up to me now to basically get in and do the best that I could do. Um, you know, they always, they always say, you know, if you don't try, you don't know what you can achieve. And it's a case of that, isn't it? You know, don't, if you don't buy a lottery ticket, you're never going to win the lottery. <laughs> mm. And uh, now you're an avid sports. You, you play tennis and you do cycling and hill walking and such. Which sports do you think are similar to being a fighting pilot? Is it None tennis where you have to <laughs> play tennis with different. two rackets and two balls, perhaps? Uh, probably skiing. Probably skiing's the closest you're going to get because you get the experience of the um, speed. Uh, probably that's the closest you'll get. And that's how I get my thrills now. Fast mm. up the hill. <laughs> Fast up the hill. Mandy, warm thank you and the best of luck now on your journey towards the future and through the air and on land. Thank you very much, Daniel. And if anyone would be interested in um, reading my book, um, are you happy for me to do a plug for it? Absolutely. So I do have a copy here. So basically, it's a, a, a wonderful book called An Officer, Not a Gentleman, uh, and it's available on Amazon. So if anyone is interested in reading the inspirational journey of a pioneering pilot, then there you go. <laughs> Fantastic. We look forward to that. Lovely. Well, thank, thank you, Mandy. You so Great to meet you, Daniel.